Hello everybody, this is the final case of the preparation for practice clinical cases. This patient is presenting with chest pain. So again, you have already met Mr. Majid in your primary care sessions. What are the learning objectives for today? Well, hopefully by the end of this tutorial, you should be able to know what is meant by the term acute coronary syndrome and investigate and start initial management of acute coronary syndrome. So as a recap, you met Mr. Majid in your primary care session. He's a 50-year-old, 58-year-old Bengali man who is admitted to the acute medicine unit with severe 10 out of 10 central chest pain radiating down his left arm for the last hour. He describes the pain as crushing in nature. It's not made worse by breathing. He is sweaty, pale and nauseous. He has a background of type 2 diabetes and hypertension. He takes metformin 500 milligrams BD and amlodipine 10 milligrams once a day. He smokes cigarette, uh, sorry, 15 cigarettes a day for the last 30 years. His BMI is 35.4. So let's pick out some of the uh, important bits in that history. So he's 58, so he's in the right age for atherosclerotic disease. You'll note that as well as the central chest pain, it radiates down his left arm, and this is particularly significant for uh, pain of cardiac origin. For example, patients who have pain down their right arm, it's very unlikely to be cardiac. The pain is crushing, and it's not made by worse by breathing. This is otherwise known as pleuritic chest pain, and so that tentatively goes against things like pulmonary embolism, pneumothorax, pleural effusion, pleurisy, and pneumonia. Uh, the sweatiness, pale and nausea is not particularly specific to cardiac presentations. He has type 2 diabetes and hypertension, which are of course risk factors for ischemic heart disease. He takes metformin and amlodipine. He smokes 15 cigarettes a day, so he has a significant smoking history and a raised BMI. So what do we always do in this situation? Well, we do the ABCDE assessment. So his airway is patent. And remember how about how we can tell patent airways the patient is able to talk and maintain their own airway. He has a above normal respiratory rate, oxygen saturations are 97% on room air, which is normal. He has good air entry bilateral with no added sounds. His blood pressure is 156 over 90, which would go towards significant pain. And again, if you want to uh, interested in pain and analgesia, there is a tutorial under the acute medicine section on pain and analgesics. Heart rate is 88, capillary refill time is less than 3, and he looks pale, sweaty, and nauseous. He is apyrexial, moving all four limbs, and is alert. His abdomen is soft and non-tender with no leg swelling, so apart from the elevated BP, which can be a normal finding in patients who have well-controlled hypertension, um, then actually, uh, similarly to Megan Jenkins, often the initial uh, ABCD assessment may not reveal anything particularly interesting or exciting. So first question for you on this final case, based on the patient's history, what is the single most likely diagnosis? A. Pulmonary embolism. B. Acute myocardial infarction. C. Gastroesophageal reflux disease. D. Aortic dissection. And E. Angina. And similar to the other three cases, pause here until you have an answer. So the answer is B. Myocardial infarction. Okay, so let's have a quick look at the others. So pulmonary embolism is unlikely. The patient has left-sided chest pain. He has um, no known risk factors for pulmonary embolism. He hasn't got any pleuritic chest pain and his saturations are normal. So those things initially would go against pulmonary embolism. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, although can be very painful, uh, it does not radiate particularly aside from uh, the sternum and um, the gastroesophageal junction. Uh, so also these sorts of features um, are unlikely and you wouldn't get, for example, hypertension in the context of acute GORD. Aortic dissection is unlikely, although should always be considered in patients who have tearing, particularly interscapular pain, or the patient has um, hypotension rather than hypertension um, of unknown cause. Uh, also in aortic dissection, uh, the D-dimers of the patient are also extremely high. 
So initially he may have had angina, but clearly he's presenting with an acute cardiac event. Therefore, it cannot be angina, as angina is only seen in those who have stable symptoms or symptoms that are well controlled uh, with minor medications such as a GTN spray. Next question, what is your next investigation of choice? And again, pause when you have the answer, uh, before pause until you have the answer. A, CTPA or CT pulmonary angiogram. B, chest x-ray. C, coronary angiogram. D, troponin or E, electrocardiogram. And the answer is E, electrocardiogram. So let's go through the others. So CTPA, pulmonary angiogram, is primarily for the exclusion of or confirmation of pulmonary embolism. And if you are suspecting uh, cardiac disease, then there's no value in doing a CTPA. A chest x-ray would be important um, and unlikely to form part of your workup. But the next investigation is an ECG because it gives instant diagnostic information. So a negative chest x-ray doesn't tell you whether this patient is has uh, cardiac pain or not. But will point towards things like uh, respiratory causes of pain, such as perfusion, pneumonia and so on. None of which this patient has so far as he has no fever and clear chest sounds, normal saturations. So we would ideally get a coronary angiogram, however, being realistic, unless Mr. Majid is having a STEMI, which at the moment there's no clear evidence that's what he's having, we wouldn't put, there's no clear indication for immediate coronary angiogram. If Mr. Majid had ST elevation in the ambulance en route to the Royal Free, then we, he would be diverted to the cath lab and have an urgent primary PCI and assessment by one of my colleagues in cardiology. We would also do a troponin, which we'll come on to later, but we may not get the result of that for one to two uh, hours or more. So a quick, simple, immediate test, which would potentially be diagnostic or of most diagnostic yield, is of course the ECG. So troponin is a test um, which has become a little bit like the G-dimer, done in all sorts of circumstances um, and so often is applied bluntly uh, when we really should be thinking more about when to actually request a troponin and its interpretation. Um, obviously its primary function is to determine whether there has been an ischemic cause um, for the pain which would cause an elevated troponin. However, there are multiple non-ischemic causes of ele elevated troponin, so it's important to bear some of these in mind, and particularly the patient's medical history. So examples include chronic renal failure, myocarditis, tachyarrhythmias, pulmonary embolism, congestive cardiac failure, cardiomyopathy, sepsis, exercise, pheochromatoma, and cardiac surgery. Now, knowing all these is important. This comes back to um, the prescribing point of view, um, which you'll have a tutorial and a Q&A session on, is that giving high dose antipalic agents and low molecular weight heparin blindly in the frail elderly can cause gastrointestinal upset and ulcerative bleeding. So it's important and good practice that when you're doing any prescribing, you check to see if your patient's already on antiplatelets or anticoagulants. So this here is a reminder about where to put the ECG dots. I know Tom Moodle, uh, there is a video on how to perform an ECG under the cardiology section. So this is Mr. Majid's ECG. Pause the video here and have a look at what you think the diagnosis might be. So question, what is the single most likely diagnosis having looked at the ECG? Is it A, anterior ST elevation myocardial infarction, B, posterior ST elevation MI, C, inferior uh, ST elevation MI, D, lateral ST elevation MI, and E, anterolateral ST elevation MI? So the answer is C, inferior ST elevation MI, and I'm about to show you why in the next few slides. So you can see here, this is a 12 lead ECG, and you can see that we have divided the uh, territories uh, up onto the ECG. So you can see uh, you have lateral, 
uh, myocardial infarction in lead 1, AVL, V5, V6, inferior, lead 2, 3 and AVF, and anterior, V1 to V4. Quite a simple scheme to try and remember to give you a rough idea about where the patient's myocardial infarction might be. So, let's go one step further. Which is the most likely coronary artery that has been affected? A, the left main stem, B, the left anterior descending, C, the left circumflex, D, the right coronary artery, and E, the left diagonal artery. I'm going to be nice and give you a bit of extra help here. So this slide here shows you the gross anatomy of the heart uh, with a particular focus on, on the location of the arteries and the valves. This is a uh, picture from Pinterest. And again, this shows you the ECG leads uh, and where uh, they are in relation to uh, the walls of the myocardium and the likely artery. So you can see, for example, in 2, 3 and AVF, where you have ECG changes, this is likely to be a right coronary artery uh, to the posterior descending branch uh, myocardial infarct, or to keep it simple, the right coronary artery. And you can see this here demonstrated on the ECG, where in Mr. Majid's uh, ECG, we saw changes in 2, 3 and AVF, so this is highly likely to be a right coronary artery or inferior myocardial infarction. So the most likely coronary artery is D, right coronary artery. So which is the single most appropriate initial management of this condition? You'll notice that you have either aspirin or ticagrelor on choice, aspirin 75, ticagrelor 90 and various ratios on there. Uh, I'll give you a clue. If you're stuck, you can look in the BNF, which will give you guidance. Pause the video here until you have decided your answer. And the answer is D, aspirin 300 milligrams or ticagrelor 180 milligrams. You need to be mindful again to go back to what I was saying earlier about prescribing. Ticagrelor is a quite a um, advanced or newer antipalier agent, but can cause significant bleeding. In fact, ticagrelor can have its half-life as long as a week. So it's important that you be mindful that before you give frail elderly patients ACS medications, uh, that you consider its effect. So let's talk a little bit about acute coronary syndromes now. It's an umbrella term for unstable angina or TROP negative acute coronary syndromes. Um, so again, you would take into account these three things. So um, the history, of course, any possible ECG changes. It might be that in order to see these ECG changes, you need to put the patient through a myocardial perfusion scan, for example, or dibutamine stress echo. Um, the days of exercise testing via treadmill um, are few and far between, although they are occasionally done. These patients will have negative troponin, but they will have a worsening of their symptoms. An NSTEMI will have a positive troponin. Uh, again, similarly, they'll have ECG changes and um, a history which would go uh, with NSTEMI. Or it might be that you have history, you'll have ECG changes as, as find, defined by ST elevation, and of course you'll have a positive troponin. The pathogenesis is similar, but of course this is advancing uh, ischemia and inflammation of the coronary arteries. The initial treatment is similar, except to say with a STEMI, you will proceed immediately to coronary reperfusion. You want to be cautious with diabetics, this is a good practice point, so patients who have fairly advanced diabetes and may have a neuropathy, they may not get the classical symptoms of myocardial infarction, and so actually the time in which you recognise the STEMI or NSTEMI will be when they are infarcting and quite poorly and have pulmonary edema. So this is just a summary of how to classify uh, clinical signs and symptoms of acute coronary syndrome. Of course, your primary test is to do a 12 lead ECG. Uh, and you've got the criteria here for ST elevation to diagnose a STEMI. 
and other ECG alterations or normal ECG then depends on troponin management and you can see about the high risk patients include dynamic uh, ECG changes, ST depression, rhythm instability and diabetes and of course Mr Majid has a STEMI but he also of course has diabetes. This is just a summary diagram uh, of an acute coronary syndrome. You can see the uh, layers of the lumen, which develop asymptomatic atherosclerotic plaques, a little bit like a fried egg appearance. Uh, then that um, becomes a fixed plaque. Uh, then in time, there will be plaque disruption, uh, which causes platelet aggregation, uh, platelets like platelets. Uh, they get very, very sticky, which then becomes unstable and the uh, platelet aggregates to form a thrombus, which then goes on to cause the myocardial infarction, uh, as seen at the bottom of this slide. So some risk factors and things to think about when you are clerking these patients. So modifiable, smoking, obesity, diet, lack of exercise, high serum cholesterol, I know two of those probably apply to me at least, hypertension and diabetes mellitus. Non-modifiable non include increasing age, so that's definitely me, male, that's me as well, ethnicity and family history, that's the one thing I don't have. So you can see that there are a range of modifiable things uh, and non-modifiable things. So let's go back to Mr. Majid and see how he's getting on. So the cardiology team come to review Mr. Majid on the AMU and they want to take him to the cardiac cath lab uh, fairly urgently is remember that he has a NSTEMI, uh, sorry, a STEMI. Whilst reviewing, waiting for transfer, Mr. Majid complains of lightheadedness and breathlessness. His observations are as follows. Blood pressure is 90 over 60, pulse 28 beats per minute, respiratory rate 22, SATs 98% on room air, and he is apyrexial. I would just suggest that you pause the video here, think a little bit about what you think the problem might be and what you might do. So we do a repeat ECG and here it is for you to review. Pause here if you need to take some time to have a look at it. So the question is, what does this ECG show? Is it A, first degree AV block, B, second degree Mobitz type 1, uh, C, second degree Mobitz type 2, D, complete heart block, or C, sinus bradycardia? And the answer is D, it's a complete heart block as there is no relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes, which is why you can see the profound um, symptoms such as dizziness uh, and near syncope and also here's the bradycardia. So what's your initial management going to be for Mr Majid in this crisis? Is it going to be A proceed to angiogram, B per percussion pacing, C atropine 500 milligrams, D ad an adrenaline infusion and E transcutaneous pacing? Pause here until you have the answer. And the answer is C, atropine 500 milligrams. Now let's talk about the uh, others for a moment. So he does still need an angiogram. However, Mr. Majid is cardiovascularly unstable. And so if he's on the AMU and you need to go to the cath lab, he's not stable enough to go at this time. He needs stabilizing and then transferring for his angiogram. So percussion pacing, so this is a rather old fashioned, uh, if not rarely used now, method of literally thumping on the heart like a tub thump to try and pace the heart. Now we have transcutaneous and transvenous pacemaker uh, for that instead. So atropine is the first line and I'll show you the bradycardia algorithm in a moment. An adrenaline infusion at this stage will be rather extreme uh, as the patient is uh, only dizzy, he's not had a cardiac arrest. Uh, an adrenaline infusion would need uh, in going via a central line and will also cause significant hypertension and tachycardia and is likely to make an awake patient feel pretty unwell. And then you've got E, transcutaneous pacemaker, where you'd use your pacing pads, similarly to the DFib um, pad position. And I will arrange for a tutorial on this at another time. 
So this here is from the Resource Council website, www.resource.org.uk. And remember, like all clinical emergencies, you assess using the ABCDE approach, do the ECG, obtain IV access, and then obviously identify any electrolyte abnormalities. Are there any adverse features? So what does this mean? So shock, which basically means that any signs of um, organ uh, misperfusion, so uh, low blood pressure, um, deranged liver function test, using ease and so on, low urine output. Syncope, which is different, remember, to a vasovagal, myocardial ischemia, and signs of acute heart failure, such as pulmonary edema. If there is, then you would give atropine 500 micrograms IV stat. If there's a sat satisfactory response, you would then consider a, whether there's a risk of asystole. So has he had a recent asystolic cardiac arrest? Has he had Mobit type 2 AV block, which is now degenerated into third? Does he have complete heart block with a broad QRS or a long ventricular pause? Then you consider these measures, such as atropine again, or transcutaneous pacemaker, or an infusion of isoprenaline, uh, which is commonly used in coronary care units, adrenaline, or alternative drugs, which I'll come to in a moment. If you haven't given, if you've given the atropine once and there's no immediate um, uh, improvement, uh, you'd reassess and consider giving a further dose of atropine up to three milligrams. Or you'd use your defib, you could set up for transcutaneous pacemaker. Uh, then if need be, you've got, you can refer the patient to critical care or if they're in a resource bed and consider giving isoprenaline and adrenaline. Uh, if you're lucky, the patient will then need to go to the cath lab for a transvenous pacemaker and then also he can have his angiographic procedure plus minus a stent at the same time. Other alternative drugs that will cause tachycardia include aminophilin, which is used in the treatment of COPD, dopamine, glucagon and glycopyrrolate. If you want to read around these guidelines, again, I suggest that you go to the Resource Council website and they give a very good overview of all of the advanced life support algorithms. There is a, also a talk that I've prepared for you on the ALS algorithm, and that is available on Moodle already. So thank you all for listening. This completes all four clinical cases for preparation for practice. I now suggest that you work through the following, the handover section, the ALS section, and the prescribing. There'll also be posted a Q&A prescribing session with my uh, colleague, Dr. Parekh. Uh, there's also the SJT section, or the situational judgment test section, can be completed in your own time. If you have any questions, reminded that you can email us here at the Royal Free at um, Royal Free Teaching Fellows at gmail.com or myself, james.piper at ucl.ac.uk, if you have any specific questions about the presentation or upload of this uh, presentation.